Pastor Lee, would you come and just take your liberty this morning, and we love you. Let's give my dad a big hand as he comes. Amen. Hello. And the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. How many can say, I know that the Lord has added me here in this house called Generations Church. Can I see your hand? Can you wave at me if you are? I want to say a, a tremendous thank you for the reception that I've received, Leah has received. We have been so received, so much love. So many have said so many kind things about the tremendous legacy of what God did. And I want to say it just like I meant it. To say it, God did it, amen. Because when I discovered the revelation that I'm going to give you this morning, that I used to take seven hours to teach it, I'm going to do it in about 30 minutes. Because I've, I've discovered a way to release it as a seed. But God did this not because I spent four years at undergraduate theology, which I did, and six more years at seminary, which I did. I was still desperate I'm talking about desperate. They've said for years, said, where did you learn that? I said, I learned it in the place of desperation. Well, you had all those years of Greek and all those years of systematic, the, all that stuff, all that seminary, the master's and doctor's degree. Oh, I said, I learned any of this there. What I got, I got on my face praying with a man who's in heaven now named Bob Wilhite. Amen. And I thought it was just for me. And when I got it, I brought it to a home in Rockwall, Texas. Fourteen people were meeting there. And from there, we went to 140, and from there it blew up. And a pulpit for the nation and the world was established. Amen. One of the greatest things that happened in those years happened to a man who has now been, I call my friend. His name is Eldred Sawyer. Bishop and pastor, senior overseer to Care Center Ministry and also Hilltop Church. Eldred, you're my friend. And I want to tell you, I love you today. And I'm thankful that we are sister churches with generation. Because I had the joy and the privilege to preach there for 24 months back a decade ago. And I got to really taste, amen, not just what it meant to have a real friend. I've said for years, all you need is Jesus and one good friend. Because if two agree on earth, it shall be done, and I'm still alive. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that I do have one good friend, and I have a, a godly man of God that is a, my son, John Aaron Lee. Amen. Your pastor... Your pastor did a job yesterday from this pulpit right here where I stand that was overwhelming to me because when I left, I reminisced about the fact that when he was only about four or five years old, I was praying in a prayer place in our home back then and I had a, I had a, demonic attack that John wasn't going to live out his full life. And it's a fear because I was so honored to have a son. And the enemy was trying to steal that joy from me. And I was down praying and while I was praying, I had a vision. How many of you believe young men see visions? And by the way, I do now dream dreams. But in my vision, I saw little John running into the arms of Jesus and the joy of that experience, what I was actually seeing in a vision of Jesus just taking little John, then four or five years old, and holding him. It was just explosive, effusive joy. And it took all the fear away. And then a little knock came on my door where I was praying, and I opened the door, and there was John. It, it couldn't have been six or seven in the morning and little John got up and said daddy I had a dream I said what did you dream John he said I dreamed 
that I was running into the arms of Jesus. And he was holding me in his arms. How many believe that gave you goosebumps if that happened to you? How many that gave you goosebumps since then? Well, it happened. And when I stood here or sat here yesterday during the celebration of life for our dear sister Jean Howell that now wouldn't want to be back here. She's singing up in heaven. Amen. Dr. Jerry's wife that went on to be with the Lord. John stood here and preached and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and gave me a verse of scripture that I'm, I'm going to flip back to just because I want to and I want to give it to everybody because he gave it to me concerning John once I started uh, preparing for this message today that will not be long, but it will be strong. Amen. Y'all understand what I just said? I'm not going to be long. But I'm going to be strong. Isaiah chapter 46. And I'm so thankful for all of you who have prayed for us. And particularly my friend Michael Conti that's here today. A great apostolic prayer intercessor for us. Listen to me. It says in Isaiah chapter 46. Verses 3 and 4. Listen. He says, O house of Jacob and all the remnant of the house of Israel. Who have been upheld from your birth, been upheld by me from your birth. It says from the belly. God knew you when you were in your mother's womb. Amen. And it goes on to say, who have been carried from the womb, even to your old age. I am he, the Lord says. Even to your gray hairs. And for some of you, even to your no hairs. Even to your gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made and I will bear. Even I will carry and I will deliver you. I had a word come to me this morning when I was praying and interceding early in the morning. And I heard the Lord just whisper to me, I'm carrying you. Well, I started praying for John and lifted up Pastor Eldred and so many of you that... I, I haven't seen in so many years. He said, I'm carrying you. I'm carrying you. Sometimes when you go through the valley of the shadow of death, you don't feel it. Sometimes when you're faced with adversity that's beyond speaking so deep, you feel the pain that you cannot even express it. Can I say to you, hallelujah, he's still carrying you through those waters, through those rivers, through that fire, and he'll keep on carrying you. Until he carries you straight into the arms of Jesus himself. And he'll hold you with effusive, majestic, glorious joy. Hallelujah. Somebody lift a hand and say, he's carrying me today. I received that word. That is a word from God. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, when I had COVID twice, the second time I had, I had blood clots in my lungs and it was terrible in the natural. But he was carrying me. And he wasn't through with me, and I know he wasn't, because I'm still alive. <laughs> and he's not through with you either, because you're breathing, Amen, and because you're here, yes. and you're hungry, and you're ready. Amen. I did a little Bible study this week that overwhelmed me again from the 8th chapter of the book of Romans, the most familiar chapter in all the writings of St. Paul. He says, there is therefore now, verse 1, no condemnation. Everybody say, no condemnation. no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Tammy. Don't go far away. <laughs> Amen. I, I saw you out the corner of my eye. And some even have believed through the years I have eyes in the back of my head. Amen. We love Tammy. Amen. Amen. She's, a, she's, she's a John's assistant that helps run this place. Amen. No condemnation, and we read on in verse 26, I'll go quickly. Likewise, the Spirit helps our weaknesses or our infirmities, for we do not know how to pray as we ought to, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which we cannot intelligibly utter. Many believe that's the prayer language of the Holy Spirit reaching out, and I know about 80% of my prayer time, that's what I do. But can I tell you, because there's so much I need to pray about, I don't know how to pray as I ought to, 
but the Spirit Himself in me is praise. And then that next most familiar verse says, And we know all things work together for good to them that love God. All things are not good, but all things work together for good, not for all people, but for those who love God and the ones who are called according to His purpose. So does anybody here love God? Anybody here call for His purpose? Can I say to you today, regardless of what you've been through, it's working now for your good. Glory to God. And so there's no condemnation, he says in the beginning here. And because of this word, there's no frustration. Because no matter how bad it was, it's working now for your good. Somebody help me say praise the Lord. Amen. No condemnation, no frustration. And then the end of the chapter goes like this, and I love it. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, furthermore is risen from the dead, who also is even at the right hand of the Father, who makes intercession for us. And then he asks this question, who shall separate us from the love of God? Tribulation, sword, peril. He gives a whole distress. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. Neither height, nor depth, nor angels, nor principalities, nor any created thing will separate you from the love of God. So there's no condemnation. Say it out loud. No condemnation. No frustration. Because it's all working for my good. Say it out loud. It's good to get the word in your mouth. I, I'm the only one I know could have caught my glasses when they fell right there. That's the one more miracle you've seen today. No condemnation. No frustration. Amen. And no separation. Isn't it interesting in this passage, he slips in this little incredible revelation. The Spirit himself is praying in you. And Jesus in heaven is interceding for you. Hebrews 7.25 says, He is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, seeing he liveth ever. To make intercession for you. I have a whole sermon on that. But I'm not going to preach it. Because I don't have time. But I want to just tell you. Jesus is praying for you right now. But not only that. The Spirit is praying in you. So if you've got the Spirit praying in you. Agreeing with Jesus. Who is praying for you in heaven. Then the question is. Why are we not praying? Well I've got the answer to that question. My people are perishing. Not for lack of sincerity or lack of conviction. They're perishing or for a lack of willingness. They perish for lack of knowledge. That's what the Bible says. What if Jesus showed up at your house at about 4 o'clock in the morning, hit the foot of your bed, and you looked up, and there he stood. He said, now when you get up tomorrow, you do it my way. You pray my way. How many of you would at least try it his way? Let me, let me ask another one. How many think Jesus knows more about prayer than you do? Now, I, I wasn't bragging a moment ago when I said I went through four years of undergraduate and then six more years of graduate school. But I will tell you, all of my professors would get up and put out an outline and come back and fill in the blanks. Can I tell you, Jesus gave us a prayer outline, but he did not fill in the blanks. He gave us the Holy Spirit within to fill in the blanks. And when I started praying with Pastor Will Height back in 1978, 79, right before Church on the Rock was birthed, Pastor Will Height, God bless him forever in heaven right now. Still praying, I'm sure. Because he didn't know how to do anything else. But back then when I would pray with him, it would just be me and him at 5 in the morning. And we only did it for 18 months in a row. And he would get me up. I, he'd pick me up at 4.30 and at 5 we were praying. He would pray so loud I couldn't hear myself pray. And I have been praying in tongues for 10 years. But I heard Pastor Will Hype, Oh, Father, you are my Father. And I was praying. I'd just go ahead and pray just right along with him. Until finally one morning, while I was beginning to get into the move of the Spirit with him, I had what I would call an open vision and I saw Jesus carrying a basin. Looked like it had to be silver or platinum 
I don't know which, and he was approaching an altar. And when he got to the altar, he emptied the contents of the basin, and the contents of that basin were his blood. And when the blood hit the altar, it began to speak. And I thought to myself, and I really did, I said, i got to find that in the Word. Now, I'd studied the book of Hebrews, and I'm talking about studied it in the languages. But I had forgotten it said in Hebrews 12, verses 23 and 24, we come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Can I tell you the blood speaks for you today? And I know what it's saying. It's declaring the names, the compound names of God from the Old Testament that encapsulated totally in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I tell you, hallelujah, what I did when I saw the blood and heard it speaking in my spirit? I began to hear. Jehovah said, Can you, the Lord, my, I began to hear, I am your righteousness. I am your sanctification. What do you think you would have done if you were having that experience? What would you have done if you heard him say, I am Jehovah Shammah. I am with you. I will never leave you. I will never fail you. I will never forsake you. Jehovah Rapha, I am your healer. What would you have done? Would you just sit there like a bump on the lawn and say, golly, look at that. <laughs> no, you'd have been doing what I was doing. I was having my own prayer revival right there. Hallelujah. I was having my own prayer experience. And I didn't realize what was going on until I began to say, Father, you are my Father by the blood. Doesn't it say we come boldly before the throne of grace? Aren't you glad it's not a throne of judgment? It's a throne of grace. And it says, having therefore, brethren, boldness, we enter the Holy of Holies, not by eating the carpet, not even by staying an hour. No, we get in there. The Bible says, I'm going to quote the verse again, Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness, we enter the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus. Are you thankful for that blood today? And that blood bought every part of the prayer that teaches us how to pray. The prayer that Jesus gave in Matthew 6, in the beginning of His ministry. Somebody say the beginning. And then He gave it again in Luke 11. Everybody say the end. That was right at the end. In the book of Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, And when you pray, or He said, After this pattern, therefore pray ye, after this model, pray ye, and he gave what we traditionally have turned into a ritualistic, our Father which art in heaven, I'll only be thy name. But that's not what it was. It wasn't a ritual. It was an outline. Are you following? Seven points in the outline. And I'm going to give it to you quickly now. So put your spiritual antenna way up high, Dr. Gene. I love you, sir. <laughs> so many people I love so deeply here in this room. Father, you are my Father. Not because I got good enough, but because the blood spoke it. Amen. And bought me out of the slave market of sin and translated me out of the kingdom of Satan into the family of God, my Father. Amen. The paternal part of the prayer. That is, paternal means fatherly. You have a heavenly Father. Jesus related to the Father God. He said, oh, my Father... Again and again and again. The paternal part of the prayer. Then there's the presence part of the prayer. Where you begin to hallow His name not according to what you feel, but according to what is real. What you feel may be one thing. You may not feel anointed at all when you start praying. But if you focus on what the blood is speaking and begin to declare His name over your life, Lord, You are my righteousness. Lord, you are my sanctification. You are my peace. You are the one. And when you begin to do that, praising him for who he is, he becomes that in your experience. I don't know if you heard what I just said. But in, in Matthew 6, this is how Jesus laid it out. And interestingly, at the end of his ministry, they came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And it, he could have said, I already told you three years ago, but now... I'm going to give it to you again. Listen carefully. 
Our Father which art in heaven. What was Jesus doing as the master Roboni, the master teacher? He was laying out the prayer outline, seven points, that we, by the Holy Spirit, can walk through and let the Spirit teach us and begin to come into His presence every time by the blood of Jesus. Somebody say every time. Because John sang Andre Crouch's great old hymn, the blood will never lose its power. It will bring you into the presence of God. If you focus on what the blood is saying and praise His name, the blood is saying, you belong to God. You are a child of God. And He is your righteousness. He is your healer. He is your protector, provider. He is your shepherd. Hallelujah. And He's the banner of victory that's over your life right now. Are you thankful that He is the paternal father. He's the one that loves you with love that's beyond speaking. And he says, this is how you come into my presence. Through the name of the Lord, hallowed be your name that is declaring hallelujah. The blood is speaking for you. The presence part of the prayer. Then there's the priority part of the prayer. How many know we got to seek first? What? The kingdom of God. Help me now. And all these things will be added unto you. But right there, he said, pray. Here's the third part of prayer. There's seven parts. The third part is thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. And in the Greek language, come and be done are the first part. It goes like this. Come, kingdom of God. Be done, will of God. In other words, it's like it's literally written this way. A man putting his foot down saying nothing but the kingdom of God's coming in here today. Nothing but the will of God is going to be done through me today. Aren't you glad the Lord doesn't wake up every day and look down at you and say, Oh, I wonder what I'm going to do with that one right there. <laughs> no, he, he's already got it planned. But he's waiting for you to agree with what the Spirit inside is praying and Jesus in heaven is praying. And then he cuts a path right through the wilderness that you might be walking through. And you might not be feeling anything, but I guarantee you, when you begin to declare, come kingdom of God, be done will of God, and you pray it over you, you pray it over your loved ones, you pray it over your church, over your pastor. And I've had people for years say, where did you make, why did you make that up about going to the north, south, east, and west? I said, I didn't make that up. Have you never read Isaiah 43, verse 4 through 7? It says, uh, I, it says, I've loved you, I've honored you, I'll give people for you, I'll give men for you, people for your life, and I will say to the north, give up. It's in the Bible. And to the south, keep not back, the east and the west. Put your foot down and declare, those out there that need to be in here, let them come, O oh Lord, irrevocably drawn by the Holy Spirit. Yes. And cause the angels to be released to minister to the heirs of salvation. Give the harvest here to Generations Church. Give the harvest to Hilltop Church. Give the harvest to all that preach the gospel far and wide. Let the harvest come in because the church begins to pray. Kingdom come. Will of God be done. That's the third part of the prayer. The priority part. First, paternal. Second, presence. By the blood. Third, kingdom come. The priority part. He is the priority. And then I always encourage people to pray. After they pray for America, they pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Because there's a promise that goes with that. They will prosper who love her. And that walks you right into the, part, the, the provision part of the prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. How many believe that Jesus is still an excellent bread maker? <laughs> they brought him five loaves and two fish and he fed 5,000 men. That didn't include the women and children. And there were 12 baskets full left over. Somebody say, hallelujah, he's my provider. Amen. You've been redeemed from the curse of the law. And the blessing of Abraham is yours right now. Blessing, I will bless them so that it can be made a blessing. Not so they can become fat cats, but so that they can be channels of blessing. Give us this day our daily bread, and I charge you to be specific in your asking. Lord, you know what we need, and this is it. Tell him what it is. Don't just throw it out there to him. 
And usually, can I just interject here? Usually when I get to that part, I don't know what to, what to pray specifically. I begin to pray in the Spirit. And it's the same way with every part of the prayer. The Holy Spirit wants to pray through you. How many of you do pray in the Spirit? Can I see your hands? That's 85, 99% of you. Amen. <laughs> Most of you. But trust me, if you will allow the Holy Spirit to start praying that through you, when you get to each part of the prayer, you'll find that the Spirit Himself knows how to pray. Amen. He knows how to pray according to the will of God, it says here. And is working it all together for good, as I said. The part and part of the prayer after the provision part is the part and part of the prayer, the fourth part. He said, pray, forgive us our trespasses. How many of you have had to confess one sin to God in the last seven days? How many glad He forgave you every time you confessed it? How many had to confess two sins? How many want me to stop right there? Okay. I got it. Can I submit to you today that when you submit to Him what is trying to come as an accusation against you, whether you did it or somebody did it to you, and you have gone through something with somebody, you got to release them to God. I used to... I, 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 it came to me a little rhyme. When you're hurt, don't curse it, don't nurse it, don't rehearse it but disperse it to God, and He will reverse it. Amen. Did you hear what I just said? That's been around for a long time, but it still works every time. When I will give it to God, He reciprocates, casting all my care upon Him. Why? Because He cares for you. How much you cast is how much you'll experience His care, although His care is limitless. He's ready to reciprocate. Then after the part and part of the prayer, there is the power part of the prayer where you put on the whole armor of God. And may I just say, all four of my children were doing this by the time they were four or five years old. Pastor John Aaron Lee said about, he was sitting in the, in the back of the car and praying, putting on his armor when he was four or five years old. And he said, uh, his mama was looking at him through the rearview mirror to make sure he was praying. Amen. And so we declare our loins are girt about with truth. Amen. From our navel to our knees, our loins. Who is our truth? Jesus. Come on now to watch this now. We have a breastplate called righteousness. That's over our heart and lungs. Who is our righteousness? Jesus. Do you understand what you're doing? Our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I told a funny story in the first service. I'm going to tell it again. I have, we had an associate named Eddie. And Eddie Singley was preaching one morning. And I looked and I saw in the burgundy shoes, most beautiful shoes. And I said, those look just like my shoes. I thank God I had some shoes in my closet because John would give away all, my, all his shoes. And then he took Eddie into my closet and said, just take a pair of his if you need a new pair. And I'm looking at those shoes. And then he's preaching in my shoes. <laughs> I said, John's been at it again. I'd have to be buying him a new jacket and new tennis shoes every week because he was out giving to the poor. And praying in our home with a hundred kids and I'd come in on Friday night and they were laying all over the floor under the power of the Holy Spirit. This didn't start last week, ladies and gentlemen. Feet shod with the preparation. That the word preparation is the word readiness. Now I know I've heard myself say, and I'm sure you've said it too, Lord, I'm just not ready for that right now. But can I tell you, there's an ever ready one living in you. And the ever ready one is the Lord Jesus Christ. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel so we can walk in the Spirit. Everything you got in the natural when you got birthed into this world, you also got in the Spirit realm when you got born again. You got eyes that see with the Spirit. You got fingers that can touch with faith. You got feet that can walk according to the Spirit. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And your feet are shod. Above all, you take a shield of faith. Our faith is by Him and our faith is in Him. Can I say it again? For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. Did you hear that? 
neither one are from you. But faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, and that is all because of His grace. If you're saved today, you're saved by the grace of God. Not by works, lest any man should boast. I hope you all are listening. Hallelujah. Our faith is in Him. Why? Because our faith was by Him. Because it all came by grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace, my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. I remember the hour I first believed. Shield of faith. Pull down the helmet of salvation. I mean, glad you can pull down a helmet called salvation. Let me just tell you, it says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Power. Then he said, you take unto you the whole armor of God. When I first learned this, I was a youth pastor, and the Lutheran spirit-filled guy came into my office and said, do you put on the whole armor of God every day? And I said, oh, I know that wonderful Ephesian passage. I just studied it in Greek. I know all about it. He said, I didn't ask if you know about it. I'm asking you, do you do it? I never thought about that. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, this is how you do it. You declare Jesus is my helmet of salvation. My have the mind of Christ. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. He dwelt among us. And we beheld Him as the only begotten of the Father. Jesus Christ is in your mouth when you speak the, a word of faith which does not come by repetitious, monotonic, or monotonic just saying words. No, no, no. It comes through you as you're praying. The Lord will begin to give you a word, and there's a word for every circumstance of your life. If you'll take time to pray, and then when you get through, you listen. Amen. You'll be able to say with David, I've been dwelling in the secret place of the Almighty. I will dwell in that secret place. And then it says, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, and my God. In Him will I trust. Amen. Are you thankful for that today? Because the next word in Psalm 91 is, Surely He will deliver you. Without any question, and I've often thought that was building a hedge of protection around me, and I know I would, be, would not be standing here preaching without that hedge of protection built around me. Miracles beyond telling, and I won't take time to begin to tell you that in the last 30 years, and the 20 years before that as well, but now 52 years preaching the gospel, in the last 30 years, non-stop traveling and having incredible challenges in my body, but at the same time I found out that what I'm preaching is true. Amen. Amen. No condemnation, no separation, and no frustration. We're just going to keep believing the Word, preaching the Word, standing on the Word, and allowing the Word to work in us that which is well-pleasing to God. Amen. And so that's the power part of the prayer. And then it ends the same way it started. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Can you say it with me? Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. And the glory, isn't it beautiful? It starts with hallowed be your name by the blood. It ends with thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. And the word amen doesn't mean that's it. That's all I'm going to do today. No, amen means so shall it be done. In other words, everything I just prayed through will be done in my life. Now, Jesus is the one who told his disciples... You teach them, when He gave the Great Commission, teaching them what I commanded you. He said, when you pray, say, and gave this outline. Not only in the beginning, but also at the end. And He says, now, this is so simple. And this is me talking now. But me, by the Spirit of grace, I'm telling you that you can do this. By the time... All four of my children were five years old. They could pray all the way through this. The paternal part, Father, you're my Father. By the blood of Jesus, I say, hallowed be your name, my righteousness, my sanctification. Then the, pre then the, 
the priority part, nothing but your kingdom is going to come. Nothing but your will is going to be done. The provision part, give us this day our daily bread. And praying along slowly, letting the Holy Spirit pray through you as you walk through this thing. You'll find out like the, Dr. Peter Wagner said, I couldn't pray five minutes before my mind was racing around until I got your teaching. He said, but once I got it, I found myself getting past an hour and wondering what happened to that hour. When you sow to the Spirit in time, during time, you reap eternity. Amen. And time then becomes a commodity that you sow to God. And you that don't have enough time to get stuff done, you'll find there's more time that you will reap that you'll be saying, what am I going to do? I'll never forget after I preached the first time in Seoul, Korea for Dr. Cho at the largest church since the day of Pentecost. He said, I don't have anything to do. I said, well, Dr. Cho, you're passing over a million people. He said, I know, but we pray. We pray all night. We pray early in the morning. We, the whole church prays. It's the way we, it's our culture. And I will never forget watching them come in a 60,000 seat auditorium eight times on a weekend. And then the ancillary auditoriums all around. And I thought to myself, oh Lord, let us have a prayer revival in America. And so I've done all I know to do. And God raised up a great pulpit from Rockwall, Texas that has now disseminated this word all over the world. And I'm praising God. I'm on my feet today. And I'm ready to do it again in the name of Jesus. Somebody help me shout. Hallelujah. The scripture comes to my, to my mind by the Spirit, not unto us, not unto us, but unto thy name we give glory. It's not because of our flesh. It's because of the foreordained plan of God. And somehow by the grace of God, we've stepped into it. Now we got to finish it. we got to go on and do what he's given us to do. And so I'm calling. Come on, Tammy, help me. I'm calling today for a fresh prayer anointing to fall on every one of you. I believe that God wants to release a prayer anointing here this morning that will literally spread out all over. Not only this congregation, but through this prayer time. How I many know there's no distance in prayer? But it starts somewhere. And I'm glad I got to preach here in my son's church where he is pastor, a full-grown man of God. Preaching this revelation that is so simple. Anybody can do it. How many of you say, I get it? Oh, let me see. Oh, did I come to the right place? Yes, I did. Amen. <laughs> How many of you say, hey, I not only get it, I can do it. It's not a bad thing to say when you enter your prayer time, help me, Holy Spirit. Pray through me, Lord. But you've given me this outline that came from the lips of Jesus. Can I say it again? Nothing dead ever came out of the mouth of Jesus. His words are spirit, they are life, and they're eternal truths. And the result of that will be if you'll take that outline and let the Spirit start breathing on it and praying through you, you'll have the experience of the early apostles. That's how they built the church in the first century, second, third. They had nobody but the Roman government trying to kill them. But yet they exploded so greatly that the Roman government started building them buildings so they could separate them and destroy them the church. Well, praise God, Pastor Eldred. Amen. You and Brother John are one. Amen. Amen. In the spirit as well as cooperating together in service to people. And I'm going to ask the Lord not only for, for you to understand this, but for you to get it and begin to do it. Jesus said, blessed are you that hear, but happy are you who do the will of God. And so I'm asking for this prayer anointing. Again, I'll close with this. A lady was interviewing me on a live television broadcast. 
And she was known to have some little bit of a temper. She owned the network, she and her husband. And I'm not going to call any names. Tammy Faybaker. And I was being interviewed because I was teaching this, this <laughs> I was teaching this prayer material and and I, I, you know she said, now you're well known for having this prayer outline from something you got somewhere. I don't know. She said, I'll tell you what prayer is to me. It's just hard work. And I very softly said on live television, oh, but the way of the transgressor is hard. <laughs> Oh, she rose up on her chair and began to give me heaven. <laughs> and went, immediately, the television screen went to black because they knew it wasn't going to stop. They went to sell the Holy Land tour quick. <laughs> and then when it came back, she said, Pastor Larry, would you tell me how you do this? Tell me what you know about this really. She had settled right down, and I started teaching, and we went for two hours teaching what you just heard in the last 35 or 40 minutes. Oh, glory to God. Tammy got it. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I'm thankful for everybody else, high and low, and everywhere in between. I did get an invitation to Nagaland, but I don't feel led. That's right, above India, before China. Oh, by the way, there's a whole colony of Eskimos up in the Antarctica. I just got an invitation to go to the Antarctica, too. I hadn't heard the Lord on that yet. <laughs> no, I've been listening, but he and I. Silence. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Appreciate that nothing. But when John Aaron said, would you come, Dad, and just release this prayer message and pray it over our people. I want you to just grab yourself like this and hug yourself real good and, and until you go, uh, uh. That's me hugging every one of you. Amen, right now. That's me hugging every one of you. Now, if you receive this prayer, just lift your hands to God. Because the Bible said, I would that men and that be women lift holy hands to God without wrath or without doubting and say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Say it out loud. Thank you, Lord Jesus. When I pray, I must say. And you gave me your outline. The master teacher. And I will take it. And I will implement it in and through my life for the glory of God and for the finishing of the work that you want to do in and through my life. In Jesus' name. Now let me put, put your hand over your heart and let me reach my hand out to the congregation. Father, I pray an anointing will move beginning today by my word in the name that is above every name, by the name of Jesus. Release that anointing, that prayer anointing that breaks every yoke and causes us to fellowship with God so we'll know how to deal with men, so we'll know how to live in this world that's gone mad. Let it be, O oh Lord, that that anointing breaks every yoke, every bondage, every brokenness. Do what only you do, Lord, because you're the only one that does it, but you do it, and you do it well. I release the prayer anointing right now at Generations Church. My son, John Aaron Lee, is the senior pastor now here. I release that prayer anointing to be the integral culture of this house in Jesus' holy name. And everybody that receives it, go ahead and just give the Lord a clap offering right now. If you receive it, give the Lord a clap offering right now. Somebody
somebody help me shout. Come on, somebody help me shout. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we ought to go ahead and praise him a little bit. We ought to go ahead and give him the glory to his name. Because if it were not for the Lord, none of us would be here right now. He saved us for this time, for such a time as this. I'm so thankful today. I see my beautiful daughter there, Joy Elizabeth, with my beautiful grandchildren there. Amen. And her beautiful husband, Steph. Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And all of you that are so beloved, I cannot begin to tell you the depth of love. John, so many, so many. And I would not have the time, if, but if I did, I'd love to sit down and have a cup of coffee with every one of you. Amen. Pastor John, come and do what you do best. Amen. If you appreciate your pastor, why don't you just let him know it right now? Amen. Go ahead and let him know it right now. That's a good thing. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. And now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer made in this place. Yes. Yeah. And I think that in the last few years, every distraction imaginable has come to the church to get us to take our eyes off of remembering who he is and to be busy with the cares of this world that can drown the heart. And I think now is the time. And what I'm so proud of when I think about Jesus, we had some amazing times in the 80s. God used my family powerfully, my dad especially, in a very unique way, unrepeatable in many ways. And as awesome as that was, and it was awesome, I also see all the struggles that we've had throughout the years and praise God for his keeping power. Amen. That has brought us to this place today. Somebody say amen. Amen. And in our weaknesses, in our struggles, my dad has suffered from cancer. He suffered from diabetes. He's had uh, terrible issues with his mouth that have been restored. And he's preaching all up and down the West Coast and all over the world. Now God is sending for him again. And I'm so grateful for his sustaining power in my dad and in the Lee family. And uh, we're here today as a testimony of God's grace and his strength. Not only in the glorious mountaintop times, but also in the valley. He has been with us through it all, hasn't he? And he's brought us here for such a time as this. And we're not finished. We're not finished. But my prayer is that the reason I brought my dad is to break. And you didn't mention in this service, but you touched on it in the last service. That Jesus repeated forgiveness twice. That's right. And he did it because... I really believe that message on breaking the voice or stopping the voice of the accuser and releasing the intercessor. The church is so, uh, at times, fighting one another. And it's time for us to pray for one another again and get excited, not about who's done us wrong, but excited about what God is up to in our lives right now That's right. and what He wants That's to right. do in this season if His people... We'll answer the call to pray. Yes, sir. And I'll tell you right now, I got mad at my wife the other day because she was kissing on the dog uh, too much. Uh, she's a dog person and she sings and the, and the birds fly up on her arm as she sings. They made a movie about it. That's my wife. I mean, she is, we've run amok with animals and you probably had to drive through half of them to get here this morning. I want her. I said, I'm, am I dog number one or dog number two in this relationship? 
And I, I really believe that God is calling us back to an intimacy with him where he's not number two, number three. Right. But in a relationship. How many of you believe he believes in that? A relationship. Doesn't mean Jesus didn't pray for Peter's faith. But Peter had to come to a place where he had a prayer life. Where he wasn't being run off by some slave girl. But he was standing up on Pentecost because he had learned how to pray. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit in this hour. We need to be in love with our master during this hour. And close to him. And not distracted. Somebody say amen. And not sleeping through the harvest right now. And not bickering over things that don't matter. Because we all know how to be petty. We all know how to get in our car and be negative when we leave this place. But I've asked him to come. I asked my dad to come. To release the spirit of intercession in this church. And to bind a spirit of accusation in this place. The devil's not going to run amok in our lives anymore. 2023 is going to be the year of an open heaven and where God answers the prayers of his people. And I'm believing for that in this church. I'm believing it for your life and your family. And we are going to resist that spirit and see it flee from us in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're going to lift up the hands that hang down in this place. And we're going to see Jesus do a work in this place as we answer the call. To agree with him early in the morning instead of with the accuser. The only part of the prayer that Jesus repeated. It's very interesting. It's like he gave the seven points. And then it's as though he's stepping away and he stops and he turns back around and says, Oh, if you didn't get any of those points, don't forget this. If you forgive, you will be forgiven. And if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. So he was shutting down the voice of the accuser. The accuser is the loser, ladies and gentlemen. But he's there accusing and he works with all day and night. And he works through people who have an attitude that does not say no condemnation, no frustration, no separation. They're living in a negative mentality and live there. And generally, when they're griping about others, they're talking to themselves in the mirror. They just don't know it. But can we just come into agreement right now that the accuser is bound by the blood of the Lamb? Him who, uh, him who accused day and night. He, we, the Bible says we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. The word of our testimony because we love not our lives even to death. That means we have given our lives to Jesus. So let's do it right now. Can you lift a hand with me right now? And we declare that we put our foot down and we say no more to the accuser of the brethren that has literally put its foul mouth on the word and on the people of God. I declare in Jesus name. That we put our foot down against the accuser by the blood of the Lamb. We bind him and we say you have no legal right. You have no legal right over this church or any church that preaches the name of Jesus. And we release the power of the intercessor. Because in heaven there's an accuser. But there's also in heaven an intercessor. And we're choosing Jesus today. We're choosing Jesus right now. And we declare to you, Jesus, we side with you. And we bind the accuser of the brethren. And we declare we will walk on. God, we thank you that Jesus was still praying on the cross. The only innocent man that ever lived on the earth. He still was saying, today you will be with me in paradise. He was still praying. And now he prays for us that we'll follow that incredible revelation. Thank you, Lord. How many say, I'm going to follow that as best I can? And I'll confess it. If I ever line up with the accuser, I'll say, Lord, shut my mouth. Amen. 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 Pastor John, I love you. So when God saves a man, he heals him. He heals his heart. And these points in this prayer for my healing daily. Just to remind myself, because prayer is more for me than it is for God. That's right. It reminds me of who's in the car with me and who's going out with me every day. And I don't want to forget this year. Let's grow in prayer. Amen.
Let's grow in getting excited again, supernaturally, in what God is doing in our midst. I don't want this to be a year of pettiness for you. I don't want you to go sideways over stupid. How many of you know it's always stupid? Oh, it's just stupid. And it's time to be the army God's called us to be. Amen. Amen. Let's stay humble this year. And let me pray over your heart just for a moment today. Father, I pray over hearts that have struggled with bitterness and struggled with the past and struggled with brokenness and unforgiveness, Lord. And this is a daily prayer because sometimes we have to pray it daily. Sometimes it's not just an overnight deal. It's a daily thing where we have to come before you and need your mercy and then give it to others. But Lord, for this day in this corporate setting, I pray that you break chains of bitterness off of our hearts, oh God, and set us free this year to be the family of God. Come on, you guys, amen. To be the family of God and to pray for one another and to love each other back to health. And let this be a year that we shine as the people of God in the way we have compassion for one another and bear one another up. We ask these things over this church, over this church, and over the friends of this church that are here today, Lord God, that they may take a spirit of the uh, intercessor and not the accuser into their church this year, and they may lift up the leadership, O God, and the hands that hang down, O God, and they may pour into those, Lord God, that need it, and let us be people of prayer. Just remember as a little boy, my dad's feet sticking out from the bed every morning, And this man lived it because he wanted to see success in his private life over being a public figure. And God honored it. And God has used his life mightily. His precious wife, Leah, who's here with him this morning. Um, They've traveled the world over the last 27 years that they've been married. God bless y'all. And all that God has for you. Let's do one more thing. Let's pray for them. Father, I just pray today. For this beautiful couple, Lord, and as they travel all over the world together, Lord, that you're going to use them mightily in these days. Open a door that no man can close and let the fruit, Lord God, abound to his account in this in this hour and to this family, Lord God, and over my brother, Lord God, and over all that they touch in this season, Lord God. I pray that you help my father finish his course with joy in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen and amen. We have altar workers here that just love to pray. And if you need prayer over your body, I want you to come and just receive prayer this morning. If you're physically attacked or if you have some emotional need today or something going on in your finances, come pray with us today. And if you don't know Jesus and you're not walking with the Lord, I tell you, there's no time like now to not leave. I want you to leave this place never alone again. How many of you don't want to do life alone? How many of you are thankful for God that's in your life today? I don't want you lonely. I don't want you living a life alone. And at the end of your life, cast away from the presence of God for eternity. I want you to come and say yes to Jesus. And if today is your day, come and pray with us. We love you. And we all need him. And out of our mutual need, we pray for one another. Father, be with our church today. And God bless us and let this be the start, Lord, by your spirit. As we've come and done all we know to do, Lord, today I ask you, Father, come and breathe on us and breathe on our homes and let us return to prayer, Lord God, and let us drop uh, uh, the, the shackles, Lord God, of a prayerless life. Let us be close to you this year and not distracted. We ask it over our own personal lives, Lord. Let this be a year of prayer over our lives again. How many of you have prayed hard before and you're ready to get back to it again? How many of you know what I just said? I'm praying for a season of it over your life to reign over you. The spirit of grace and intercession over your life in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Do you appreciate my dad for coming today? Let's give him a hand. God bless you, brother. God bless you, Leah. We love you. Amen. Brothers, don't fight with your wife this week, okay? Amen. Y'all pray for one another, and let's pray together. I love you all. Amen. God bless you today. Amen.